Under gravel filters, they are the type of filtration that everyone bashes, and today I hope to give a defense of under gravel filters, and in the defense I hope to elaborate upon what under gravel filters actually are and how they work, because I feel as though a lot of the misconceptions and ill thoughts towards under gravel filters come from a lack of understanding of how they work and what needs to be done with them to use them properly. And hopefully through this I'll be able to show those that think underground filters are a trash filtration that they are actually a very viable and very good filtration method that we should consider when we are choosing how to filter our aquariums. And for all of you that already enjoy underground filters, I hope that you find this entertaining as well as maybe informative and learn some new things about underground filters that you may not have known before. So let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the aquarium library. Today we're going to talk about underground filters and no, I don't always wear this type of dress when I'm doing videos, but I feel as though if I'm giving a defense to the public forum that is YouTube, then I should at least dress up and make myself look a little bit more presentable or my defense of underground filters so that when people come and attack me, at least they're attacking a well-dressed man. Let's first clear up some misconceptions about underground filters and how they work and what they are and what they can and can't do. So for those out there that don't know what underground filters are, they are simply just a plate that goes along the bottom of the aquarium and they come in a couple different forms. I'll show you those forms right now. The first one that we have here is a plate that has grooves to be able to slide additional plates into it so you can build a custom underground filter plate to fit the size of your aquarium, if, especially if it's not a typical standard size aquarium. Your second type of underground filter plate is a rigid one that's either perforated like this or one that is slits and slats and all those kinds of fun things like here. So the difference between these two is just one is perforated with little tiny circles, the other one has slats, and they all perform the same function, whether or not they are this or the little build of ones. I personally prefer the building ones because it allows better control over how versatile they are over the years because you can use these repeatedly in different setups from different sizes, whereas these are limited because they are rigid to say a 55 gallon or a 10 gallon tank or things that fit those dimensions. So I'm gonna show you guys how underground filters work with this tiny one right here because it's a lot easier to handle. There is a lift tube that normally attaches to the underground filter here and in that lift tube you either have an air stem that drops down into it or you can put a power head on top of it. And all that is doing is acting as a way to pull water from underneath the plate down here up the lift tube and into your aquarium. And as that water underneath this plate is being pulled out and up the lift tube, it is creating a draw or a pull on water because as that water is being pulled out, it needs to be replaced. And underground filters work in that you have gravel on top of here and as that water is being pulled up and out the lift tube, that water is going to go down through the gravel and go underneath the plate and continue up. And as it passes through the gravel, it is going to be both mechanically and biologically filtered, meaning that all the particulates are going, a large majority of the particulates are going to be filtered out. And then the biologic filtration is that the ammonia is going to be converted to nitrate, which is a lot less toxic for fish than ammonia or nitrite is. So while these guys aren't that flashy or, you know, showy and you're not going to show it off your friends like you would an ADA filter, they are very simple, they're very effective, and they're very cheap and easy to maintain if you know how to maintain them. The biggest complaint that I hear about underground filters is they're old and outdated, and I think that's a misnomer that we need to get out of our heads. Just because something is old and outdated doesn't mean that it can't be used, and if it's lasted for this long, it, it, it it should at least bring to mind or call to mind that it probably is a pretty good filtration method that is worthy of being, you know, going toe to toe with sponge filters or canister filters or hang on back filters or sumps or things of that nature, but they don't really get the fair shake because people just see them as being outdated. I also think that when it comes to underground filters, like I was saying before, they aren't as flashy, they aren't as showy, they aren't something that you can flaunt to the world is like, oh, look at my FS6 that I have, or oh, look at my ADA stainless steel canister filter that I have. Whereas with this, it's like, yeah, I have an underground filter on there. I paid 10 bucks for this thing, and my tank has been going like this for 15 plus years with no problems, which for my dad, he's had his underground filter place in there for 25 plus years now in his tank and hasn't had any issues because of accumulation of solids or things of that nature. And heck, you don't even have to have a filter with you know your fish tank because 
the bacteria is living everywhere and the way that an underground filter works is that it utilizes all the substrate that is in the tank as its filtration method and other people like LRB aquatics or systems like aquaponic systems specifically the UVI aquaponic systems don't explicitly rely upon a biofilter to do that nitrification process they rely upon the surfaces within their tank to do that process so an underground filter is just utilizing the bacteria that is normally and naturally present within the system to do the nitrification process for our fish and our fish tanks. And depending on how fast the flow you have at the lift tube and how deep your substrate is, you can either have aerobic or anaerobic or anoxic conditions for underground filters. I prefer aerobic conditions and don't like getting into the realm of anoxic and anaerobic bacteria and all that type. I'd rather have an aerobic environment where I have nitrifying bacteria that is converting it from ammonia to nitrate to nitrate and then having plants removing that nitrate from the system as well as water changes to remove that nitrate. So if you're removing oxygenated water through the undergravel filter you're going to have the nitrifying bacteria because they require oxygen to be able to convert that ammonia to nitrite into nitrate. And just like any other filtration system undergravel filters have to be clean and maintained and whatnot and if a person neglects a tank that has a canister filter on it and never cleans it for five years and they end up having a system crash, you're not going to blame the canister filter for the crash. You're going to blame a lack of maintenance on the owner's behalf for that crash. The same thing can be said for underground filters and those that use them. It comes from if a tank crashes and they're using an underground filter, it's probably not because of the underground filter, but it's because they haven't done anything with the underground filter for five years and they thought that they didn't have to do anything because they had a filter on that. And that's another misconception. And I have a video about that up here that I'll leave for you guys to check out after this one. If you guys are interested in learning more about why we have filters and why just having a filter on a tank isn't the end all be all, why you need to still do other stuff on top of it. So basically all I'm saying is that regardless of the filtration method that you have, if you neglect it, you're going to have problems, whether it's an underground filter tank, a canister filter, or a hang on back filter. And just because someone is using an underground filter does not mean that that is the problem with their tank. There are a lot of other things that need to be asked first before we start attacking their filtration system because we know that underground filters work and they work for a very long time and have worked for a very long time within this hobby. But people will say that, you know, underground filters are so difficult to clean and they're so hard to clean that they're impossible to clean and you have to take out the plate and do all these high, like, crazy things to it and that's just not true. With an underground filter plate, all you have to do is your normal gravel backing if you have a fish only tank. You just go down with your siphon tube, suck out all the dirty water from your tank, get rid of all of the organic compounds and leftover food and decaying poop and all that type of stuff out of the system. Same as you would do in a normal tank. Except now you're having aerated water moving through that so you're utilizing that substrate both as a area of collecting solids mechanically as well as a place to do your biological filtration. And if, for instance, your plate underneath here gets really dirty and you have a plate like this and you have a lift tube that is entirely open, you could stick, say, for instance, a piece of tubing down that lift tube with a magnet on the end. And when you get down underneath the actual underground filter plate, you could put a piece of metal underneath there, start the siphon, and just clean that out pretty, pretty easily. No problems whatsoever. You could also take a wet dry vacuum, stick that on the uh, lift tube, create a really quick uh, fast draw and pull up a lot of those solids off the bottom and get rid of most of the solids off the bottom of your filter tank. But I also think that especially in my application with the planet tank which is also a big no-no and you shouldn't be able to keep underground filters and plants together which is complete malarkey but that when you don't remove those solids from there and you have a balanced system those solids are going to be breaking down elementally from their organic into their inorganic states and your plants will then be able to utilize that fish poop, the dead plant matter, the old shrimp shells, the old snail shells. They're all going to be able to use that for minerals and nutrients that you don't have to then supplement into your system. In aquaponics, we actually take off that dirty water that you would normally backwash or clean out of your filter, put it into another tank, aerobically you know, digest it, break it down from organic to inorganic, and then add it back into the system. And it is so nutrient dense and so nutrient rich. So those same solids are getting trapped down here and they're getting broken down aerobically because we have water moving through there that is well oxygenated in the system that I am talking about. 
and that will then convert your organic compounds into inorganic compounds that can be then uptaken by the plants and create even healthier plants than what you've had before. Just like people say that Amazon stores do great in established tanks is because they have that moment of detritus there that they can use to suck all the nutrients out and grow big and strong. And then after a couple of months, weeks, years, however long it might be, once those supplies are used up and are diminished, then you have to start supplementing with root tabs to then provide all those minerals that were already in your substrate because of all the fish waste that is in there. And since I brought up the controversy of having a planted fish tank with an underground filter, we might as well talk about not being able to have an underground filter tank with cichlids, African cichlids, Central American cichlids, South American cichlids, with an underground filter and the problems that they bring and that they are all just wrong and incorrect. As well as people mentioned that underground filters don't do a very good job at keeping water crystal clear. So we'll start with that one first and we'll work our way back to the planted tank problem and the cichlid problem. So I don't know where people have come up with this idea, but underground filter tanks are very pristine. The, the, the mechanism that you're utilizing is a bunch of substrate that is collecting all these solids by slowing the water down and trapping all of these fine particulate matters. My underground filter tank is by far the cleanest tank that I have. It's much cleaner than the tanks that I run sponge filters on. It's has much fewer debris. And you might say, oh, it's because you have your hang on back filter in there. It's like, well, no, that hang on back filter just has sponges and ceramic media. That's all that it has. It doesn't have any filter floss or anything else that's going to polish the system. All the polishing is being done by the underground filter. It does a fantastic job and keeps the water absolutely crystal clear and pristine, as well as pristine biologically and converting that ammonia into nitrate. The next thing that we should bring up, and since we already talked about it a little bit, is the issue with planet tanks. And we sort of covered that, but planet tanks are fantastic in underground filter tanks. I, I don't I don't see where the issue is and if someone would I would I would love to have somebody tell me why planted tanks and underground filter tanks don't go together because my tank here is disproving that as well as hundreds of other people's tanks out there that have a lush planted tank with an underground filter because of the reasons that I've already mentioned about leaving the detritus and the old fish food the fish poop shells and whatnot to break down naturally in an aerobic environment that isn't going to be converted very readily into bad components, bad compounds like ammonia or hydrogen sulfide gas or things of that nature when it's in aerobic environment. And if there is a little bit produced, it's not the end of the world because the system can handle a little bit of hydrogen sulfide gas or a little bit of ammonia from those plant materials breaking down or fish food breaking down. The biggest thing out there and the biggest complaint or the, the biggest area of fish keeping that you can't use underground filters with is with cichlids and I also think that is a bunch of malarkey because my dad has used underground filters with African cichlids, Central American cichlids, South American cichlids, disc, not discus, he hasn't kept discus, angelfish, oscars, sevrums, uh, blood parrots, African cichlids, uh, the list goes on the number of cichlids that he's kept in that tank and hasn't had any issues with them digging down to the plates and uncovering them and losing out on all of that power of the underground filter. I will say if you are having issues or if you're keeping geophagus or things of that nature, having an underground filter is still an entirely viable option. You're just gonna put down some egg crate, the light diffuser over the top of it, put your substrate on top of that. When they start digging, they'll dig down to that light diffuser. They're not gonna dig through the light diffuser. So that way you're still keeping all of your substrate on top of your plate, but are still being able to use an underground filter while keeping the fish that you want. So the people that say you can't use an underground filter with cichlids just aren't thinking enough and are just trying to figure out a way to bash underground filters and come up with a reason why not to use them. The other thing that I've heard is that plant roots don't do very well in oxygenated environments. And I, I don't know where people came up with that idea that plant roots outside uh, don't like oxygenated environments, but that is exactly what they want. Plant roots, contrary to what you might think, still respire and still require oxygen. And when you go out to a field and see like a, like in a sports field and you see those little tiny plugs, it's them aerating the soil so that air and more importantly, oxygen can get down into the actual soil as well as a, an avenue for water to sink down into it. So the idea that plant roots don't like oxygen and they die in these type of environments is complete malarkey and that plant roots actually do require oxygen. Uh, for instance, in aquaponics, 
we intentionally supply and aerate our plant beds in our deep water cultures, which are just basically rafts of styrofoam with plants sitting on top of them like lettuce and the roots in water. And we aerate that water to make sure those plants have sufficient oxygen at their roots so they don't die. A reason why plants die outside is actually from compacted soil, from soil that doesn't allow for the passage of water and oxygen through the soil to the roots. So again, the whole idea of having oxygen at your root zone is impeding or bad for plant growth is again, a bunch of malarkey. And a very, again, bad reason to say that underground filters don't work with uh, planted tanks. Now that we sort of dispelled all these myths and all these hearsays and wives tales and things of that nature about why underground filters are bad, let's talk about why they are actually good and go on the offensive and compare them to canister filters and hang on back filters and why they go toe to toe with those type of filtration methods. But before we get into that part of the video, if you guys have enjoyed the video so far, I'd ask that you guys give the give the video a, a big fat thumbs up and uh, consider at the end of this video to check out some of the other videos I have on this channel pertaining to aquariums or underground filters or breeding or plant growing, all those types of things. So be greatly appreciated. Let's get back into the longevity of underground filters and how they compare to you know your typical canister filters and hang on back filters. So for some of you this might be a difficult task to do but I want you to think about when was the last time you heard somebody say that their underground filter broke on them like it just stopped working. It might take a little bit if you don't have a lot of people using underground filters around you but now think again when was the last time you heard somebody say that a canister filter or hang on back filter just quit and stopped randomly they had to go out and buy a new one probably a lot more frequent or a lot more times you've heard that said than an underground filter breaking. And that's because underground filters are very long lived. They have very simple parts and are very easily fixed. The biggest component that fails on underground filter tank is the air pump or power head that you have. And to replace a power head or to change out an air pump or replace a diaphragm is pretty darn easy when it comes to trying to figure out where the heck your canister filter is leaking from or having a bad o-ring on a hang on back filter that is slowly dripping water out or having a small crack in your housing of either a canister filter or hang on back filter and slowly dripping leaks. You don't have any of those issues with underground filters because they're inside of your tanks and they can take a beating and still work perfectly fine. This can get cracked, damaged, beat up and is perfectly fine. One of the other ones I actually had is broken in this area right here. And the previous person just glued it back together and is still perfectly fine and usable. Can you do that with a canister filter or hang on back filter? No. <laughs> that, that would be like just asking for all of your water to be spilled across your floor and waking up to warped hardwood floors and sopping carpet. Like you would never want to do that with a hang on back filter or a canister filter, but you can do that with an underground filter. And so when that canister filter breaks or that hang on back filter breaks, how expensive is it to replace that? How often do you have to replace it? How long do those even last? Like I was saying before, my dad has used the same underground filter plates for 25 plus years at this point and is still going on and using them. Can you say the same for your hang on back filters? Have you had to replace lots of parts or had leaky ones and had to, you know, at the last minute scramble to clean up your area and dry it out. It's not going to happen on the ground filter. When was the last time you heard an underground filter leaking and causing an entire aquarium to drain out? Probably never. But when was the last time you heard of a hose coming off of a canister filter or falling off the back of a tank from a return from a canister filter or from a sump and draining all the water out onto the floor? Pretty, pretty, pretty frequently, more common than an underground filter doing that. So again, goes to show you that this is in terms of safety and in terms of not having issues with your filtration method, this is not going to cause your system to drain. The only way that a system can drain with an underground filter is either an improperly placed air pump where you have it either below the water volume without a check valve or that you have a failure with your power head and your power head just starts spewing water everywhere but that's also very unlikely when have you ever heard of that never so these guys don't really break and if they do break it's just an air pump or a power head which is relatively cheap to replace or to repair an impeller or a diaphragm compared to the parts that go along with a canister filter or hang on back filter or having to buy an entirely new one and I think another reason why these are hated so much is because people in the industry, whether it be companies that are competing with these or people that are trying to sell them, once they sell you an underground filter, 
there isn't much else they can upsell you on. Once you have bought the Underground Filter, there isn't anything that they can charge you more for or have you have to replace, like media or polyfill or rubber gaskets or grommets or hosing or tubing that you might break by accident on your ADA stuff because it's a glass lily pipe and you got a little rough with it and now you have to go out and spend another $75 on it. Whereas with this, all you got is a lift tube, plastic plate, and you're ready to rock and roll. Yeah, you probably have the carbon inserts that you could put into the top of them, but I don't really think anyone that uses underground filters uses those and realize that that isn't really viable. It's just a throwing money away. So I think that within the industry, they aren't something that is pushed readily because if they push it readily, they're pushing away replacement parts or replacement media that they could be having people use in their canister filters and their sumps or in their hang on back filters. So they sort of, they create a one sale. They don't have multiple sales. Like for instance, the hang on back filters, you have your replaceable cartridges that people think that they have to replace every three weeks. And every three weeks, the company is making money. The company that sold my dad the underground filter plates is not making any more money because he hasn't bought anything else from them for the last 25 years. For them, that's not a good business model. For us as hobbyists, that's great because we don't have to worry about having to replace our expensive equipment when we just buy cheap, affordable, reliable, equipment to begin with. Because the only thing that you're going to have to replace an underground filter, like I said before, is the way that you're moving water through the system, whether it be an air pump or a power head. And those are 10 to $20, which is a drop in the water compared to, you know, buying a brand new canister filter or buying a brand new hang on back filter to replace the one that has broken. Like it's a no brainer when it comes to cost wise. Underground filters are far superior to those guys. And they are, very comparable to box filters and sponge filters, but there's a lot more similarities between sponge filters, box filters, and underground filters. So I'm not really focusing on that in defense of this because it seems as though people that are bashing on underground filters are, are, are saying that it's either you use an underground filter or you use a, a hang on back filter. I also think that underground filters are going to be probably superior to both uh, sponge filters and box filters just for the ease of concealing the filtration. Concealing an underground filter is relatively easy. You just plant some plants or put some wood in front of your lift tube, bada bing, bada boom, you're done. Whereas with a sponge filter or a box filter, you can get a lot more creative at how to hide those or disguise those or to, to not have them be in your system. Whereas it's just a singular lift tube that you could have be green with some plants in front and no one would be the wiser. So let's review everything we've covered up to this point. Underground filters are reliable, they're inexpensive, they are cheap to operate, they are cheap to replace and to repair, and they don't require any additional cost to them once they have been purchased. Which, for me, for a filtration method, that seems like an amazing thing in comparison to canister filters, sumps, or hang on back filters. Like, that that, that seems like it would be almost a no-brainer as to why people would be using it. Like everyone should be using them if it's that if that's easy. And it is that easy. And they are that good, just straight out. Like they are a good filtration method that deserves to have more recognition and not be bashed all the time for being an inferior filtration method or, oh, you have an underground filter, you need to replace that first, and then you have all your problems fixed. <laughs> As I said at the beginning, this is a defense of the underground filter, and hopefully I've done it justice and I've accurately defended it to you all, the YouTube jury room, and uh, you guys can cast your verdict upon them with hopefully some more information about underground filters and why they are a good filtration method and why they are in, inexpensive and why they can be used with planet tanks and why they can be used with African cichlids or Central American cichlids or South American cichlids and why they shouldn't be bashed all the time as being the reason why somebody's having issues with their aquarium. The first thing is to look at their underground filters and say, you need to get rid of that. So hopefully I have presented this to you guys very well and have done so in a satisfactory way. And if you guys are interested in underground filters now or want to look at some more videos, I do have some more that I'll leave linked here, as well as some affiliate links down in the description below for different underground filters you guys could check out. Like I said before, I personally really like these guys over this because there's a lot more versatility and flexibility in using these for the long term in multiple different tanks and multiple different systems. But I'll leave that up to you guys and let you guys experiment as to what you guys want to use with your underground filters. So I hope you guys have a blessed day. I'll see you guys in the next one. See ya.